generations to come. Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, November 30th at 1.04 p.m. And this is the TDN Writer's Room. I'm your host, Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent with Thoroughbred Daily News. I'm Randy Moss with NBC Sports and the buyer speed figures. That is Lucy behind me. No, it's not a stuffed animal. She actually is a, a live, breathing, fun dog when she's not sleeping. I'm sorry, Cameron, XBTV and First Racing. Uh, Bill, next time we've got to figure out how to get your dog in here too, because Doodle is strategically behind me licking his paw and I, I can't be responsible for whatever else he does in the show, but right now <laughs> he's well behaved. Yeah, my my uh, favorite dog, Penny, is uh, very jealous of, of all the airtime the dogs are getting. I want to remind you also that the TDN Writers Room is brought to you each week by Keeneland. And uh, let's get into the weekend racing, guys. It was a big Thanksgiving weekend. The grade one race was on Friday, the Clark at Churchill Downs. Uh, two stories here. First of all, the winner, of course, Proxy, trained by Michael Stidham, owned by Godolphin. They just seemed to win everything. But Rich Strike ran last in there. Now, uh, afterwards, the connections came out and said that he had, um, he was sick in the race. He came out with mucus, et cetera. So it looks like they have a decent excuse. But you know what? It, it's funny that he's such a polarizing horse. Some people think he's the, you know, the greatest thing ever. Uh, you know, the people's horse, the Kentucky Derby was, you know, one of the greatest events in the history of horse racing. Other people think he's a bum. I think the truth lies somewhere in between. He's a very good horse. Is he the best horse in training? No. Is he up to Epicenter and uh, Taba, the leading three-year-olds in the country? No. But he's going to have his day. He's going to win some more races. And I won't hold this race against him. Zoe, what'd you think? I think he's a really cool horse. I, I mean, people complain about not seeing horses run. Now, this guy's danced every dance. He does everything that's asked of him. He seems to lay it on the table. If you look at the Breeders' Cup Classic, he ran huge. Every race has been good. Yeah, he had an excuse, but that was his excuse, and they're sticking to it. He gets to stick around for next year as well, which is going to be great. I don't know why more people aren't getting behind this horse and enjoying him for what he is. He is a rock solid racehorse and he is the Kentucky Derby winner. And people just love to tear horses and tear people around. Let's embrace him for what he is. He's Rich Strike. And I, for myself, am looking forward to seeing him run next year. He was up there for a while in the race and he backed out. He had an excuse. Move on. I believe last week I might have said that Rich Strike was finally going to be the favorite in a race. And I believe <laughs> Zoe threw a flag on that and said, what about West Willpower? Zoe was right. West Willpower winds up the favorite over Rich Strike. But what about Proxy, the winner now? A, a really good effort by Proxy and notable on several different levels. First of all, as good as Proxy had run in his past, he had never won a stakes race of any kind. His three previous wins had been a maiden race and two allowances, all three at the fairgrounds. So he finally gets a stakes win in a grade one in the Clark uh, and finally gets a win away from the fairgrounds. He also showed a lot more mental maturity in the Clark. One of the things that had so frustrated trainer Mike Sidham about Proxy earlier in his career is that he would show some early speed on occasions and then completely come off the bridle in the middle part of the race and drop back inexplicably. And then he would come on again at the end and get a minor, you know, second, third, fourth place placing. Finally, in the Clark, Joel Rosario had him in the mix. It was a fairly slow pace early. He didn't drop out. He stayed right in there. He stayed focused all the way. And then he kicked through the lane to uh, to run down West Willpower after a, after a nice stretch battle there. It was a race that was run, I think, to the benefit of West Willpower, given the pace, and Proxy ran him down anyway. A couple of more quick notes. Good decision by a, a jockey agent, Ron Anderson, to take Rosario off of West Willpower after a six and three-quarter length win in the Fayette and go to Proxy. And now uh, Stidham will be pointing Proxy, the next big goal, the Dubai World Cup, since he's owned by Godolphin. Stidham pulled that off in 2021. Uh, with the horse name Mystic Guy. A lot to unpack there, but good win by proxy and a good excuse for Rich Strike. Uh, Randy, I just want to add one thing to that, and I'm not knocking anybody, but it wasn't a very strong race. I mean, Rich Strike was the only grade one winner in the field. Um, you know, could you give proxy credit, but at the same time say, you know what, he didn't beat the strongest field? I would agree with that. And what's going to be interesting going forward now, when you look ahead to what might be going on next spring, 
you look at the two big races overseas, the Saudi Cup, the Dubai World Cup, right? One of the top horses in training next year is going to be Taba. And he's owned by Amr Zidane of Saudi Arabia, who's very much uh, has a big desire to win the Saudi Cup in his home country. And since not that many trainers are keen nowadays, for some reason, on running in both the Saudi Cup and the Dubai World Cup, we could get a situation, Bill, kind of like 2021, when Mystic Guide had a fairly easy field to beat in the Dubai World Cup, despite the $12 million purse, uh, and was able to pull it off. I mean, Proxy may not be running. Who knows? He may not be running against the A-list American dirt horses in Dubai. And uh, we'll see what happens there, there. Done it. He's done it before. I mean, they went early with Mystic Guide, so... He's he's already got that plan in his mind. So right now, if everything goes well, that is most definitely the plan. I'll be down there this weekend to see him at the fairgrounds. All right. Uh, the other big races at Churchill um, on that card they have on Saturday, which I just love every year, is all oh, two-year-old yeah. races. There were two really nice two-year-old races with uh, Kentucky Oaks and Kentucky Derby points on the line. Um, Hoosier Philly won the Golden Rod. Very impressive there. Instant Coffee won the Breeders' Futurity. Randy, I have a question for you. Um, Hoosier Philly won her race in 143.94. Instant Coffee won in 145.25, more than a second slower. How then does Instant Coffee get the better buyer number of the two? Instant Coffee gets an 82. Hoosier Philly gets an 81. All about the pace, Bill. Uh, the first six okay. furlongs of the Colt race was run in 115.02 compared to one uh, 12.28 for Hoosier Philly. That's a huge difference in pace that just can't be made up in the last two and a half furlongs. So what uh, what all speed figure people have to do for the Kentucky Jockey Club stakes for the Colt race is just pull it out completely from the day's variant and just give an estimate, basically, on what that race should have been run in based on the past performances of the horses involved. So the times really, the comparative times of those two races don't really come into play. Having said that, even though Instant Coffee got to think what a one point better number than Hoosier Philly, I think Hoosier Philly would have won the Kentucky Jockey Club if she had been running against the boys. She was just dynamic in the Goldenrod. Uh, and, and what's really interesting about her, even though she did run that big of a number, the number is irrelevant given the way that she won, just dragging Edgar Morales to the front and winning with the greatest of ease. But the comments from trainer Tom Amos. Now, I've known Tom since he very first started training back in Louisiana Downs in 1987. I was around him way back then. He's, he's not a guy who is prone to hyperbole. And even before the Goldenrod, Tom was saying that Hoosier Philly – was the best horse he had ever trained. And of course, he had Serengeti Empress, the winner of the Kentucky Oaks. He said he'd never been around on a day-to-day -day basis, a horse with the talent of Hoosier Philly before the Goldenrod, he said that. And then Hoosier Philly goes out and runs a race like that. Um, I mean, we'll see what happens with her now. She's going to get a month off in Florida, uh, along with his colt, Curly Jack. Uh, then they'll come back to him at the fairgrounds and and he'll start pointing Hoosier Philly uh, for the three-year-old races, which might include a run against the Colts, he hinted. I mean, is it possible, guys, that the two best two-year-old fillies did not run in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Fillies? We're talking Justique, who looked terrific down at Dalmar just a couple of weeks ago. And then Hoosier Philly, who's a perfect three for three. She was a terrific buy by Lauren Carlisle for trainer Tom Amos. Her second dam is Princess Arabella, who I knew out here in Southern California. She was three for three. She was retired early for Hall of Fame at Bob Baffert. She had a talent that you just would not believe. It was just a shame we didn't see her full ability. But she was a big, growthy looking filly, much like Hoosier Philly is as well. And I have no mind that she most definitely is the best two year old filly in training. And I'm right with you, Randy. She could most definitely beat the boys. And, and one other thing, I applaud trainer Tom Amos for keeping on Edgar Morales. He's done nothing wrong on this filly at the time when we see time and time again, trainers going to bigger name riders. And long may it continue because this kid gets on really, really well with her. And he's a name that perhaps a lot of people have not heard of, but he is an extremely talented mm -hmm. young rider.
Yeah, I just want to concur with just many of the things you said. I mean, instant coffee was fine. He was fourth beaten seven lengths in the Breeders' Futurity. That sure makes Forte look good, who won the Breeders' Futurity and then absolutely came back to win the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. But, you know, I, I, mean, I talked to Tom before the race as well, and I didn't know he was getting ready to say that. And he said, this is the best horse I've ever trained. It's like, what? Wow. I mean, that that's such a statement. And you know what? I, I mean, he's now he, he's not committing to the Kentucky Derby, he just says he's keeping an open mind about it. I sure hope that they give it a chance. I mean, at least kick the tires, maybe try running in the Risen Star Stakes or something like that to see if she fits. I mean, if she's that good, which I think she is, she shouldn't the, the camp at Amos shouldn't feel that they're going to be overmatched against Colts. Um, if this is the best horse he's ever trained, then doesn't that make her good enough to give it a try? I don't think people do that enough. And I'm sure Tom would love to win the Kentucky Derby. I mean, who wouldn't, especially a trainer uh, who's a pretty high profile guy like himself that has never won it. And he must be thinking, this is my best shot I've ever had to win the Derby. Go for it, Tom Amos. Yeah, he's had some Derby horses that were long shots. You know, I mean, Tom also understands that it, it, while I think we both agree with Zoe that Hoosier Philly is probably the best two-year-old Philly in the country, I would take her in a race against Wonder Wheel. Uh, but Tom understands that he's got no chance to be voted two-year-old Philly champion. Winter Wheels won back-to-back grade ones. He said that he was tempted to tell Edgar Morales when they get to the stretch, don't baby who's your Philly. Turn her loose, let her run, make it a big blowout, and maybe she can be two-year-old Philly champion after all. But then he kind of thought about it and said, that would be silly. <laughs> yeah, I want to do that wasn't the best good. interest of the Philly. You know, he had also maybe, he said 20 years ago, he might have been tempted to run Hoosier Philly in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies and sort of rush her into that race. But, you know, now he's 61 years old. He's wiser. He's older. It's all about the Philly and keeping the Philly going and not about him. And so uh, good decision there by Tom on a couple of different levels. Well, now, uh, Len Green, the owner of Wonder Wheels, coming up on the show a little bit later. Let's not tell him. What we said about you guys saying that uh, uh, Hoosier <laughs> Philly is the best hero Philly in the country, but make it all three of us. I, I believe that as well. And that's taking nothing away from Wonder Wheel. But Hoosier Philly just looks really, really special at this point. Now, the Kentucky Jockey Club was a complete mess. It, it really was. I mean, they ran the, the half in 50. Uh, you had traffic problems for Curly Jack, who was sitting back in third, trying to find a way through on the rail. He did save ground, but he didn't get the cleanest run. He had Red Route One, who was in there behind horses and couldn't find a place to run until late. You know, Instant Coffee benefited from a clear trip, but he was also a little further back, given the really slow pace, and he was a little, you know, a little wider. It, that race was just a complete mess. And I think, unlike last year, when you had Smile Happy, Classic Causeway, and White Abario, they were the one, two, three finishers. Smile Happy second in the Bluegrass, Classic Causeway winning the Tampa Bay Derby, White Abario winning the Florida Derby. I'll be surprised if this race has that much impact on the three-year-old picture when we get to uh, April of 2023. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Don't forget, guys, that we have the 2023 Keeneland January Horses of Ages sale, which begins on Monday, January the 9th. Keeneland September grads over the weekend include the Grade 3 Native Diver winner that was defunded for Hall of Famer Bob Baffert, the Grade 2 Jockey Club winner Instant Coffee, and the Grade 2 Golden Rod winner Who's Your Philly. We already spoke about her, but Randy... What have you, have you got some coffee there? What's going on? <laughs> Look, so Instant Coffee is owned by Al Gold, who got a lot of credit and a lot of attention for naming his horse Cyberknife, right? Who won this year's Haskell and Arkansas Derby. Well, he's got another good name here in Instant Coffee. Instant Coffee is a grandson of Medallia Doro. Medallia Doro was named for this Instant Coffee. I hope the glare is not too bad. Instant Espresso Coffee. Instant Coffee, grandson of Medallia Doro. Another good name for Al Gold. And there you have it. We'll be right back with these messages from Keeneland. If this place could talk, it would roar. It would say, this is a racing. This beating heart in the heart of horse country. Steady and strong beneath the roar. Reminding us why for the love of the horse for generations to come. 
maximum security proves he's the real deal with a gate to wire win in the Florida Derby. Champion three-year-old. Maximum security has won the TVG.com Haskell Invitational. 11 triple digit bias. Maximum security. He smoked them in the cigar mile. Grade one winning four-year-old. Maximum security takes them all the way in the TVG Pacific Classic. Secure your mayor's future. Maximum security. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Practical Joe got his 17th stakes winner over the weekend as Little Vic won the City of Laurel stakes. Practical Joke now has 31 stakes performers and will stand for 25,000 in 2023. Justify was represented by his first two Japanese winners on Saturday with Jovian and Awesome Result. Justify now leads first crops by earnings and black type winners. And now, let's get to Santa's little helper, Peter Eckbert. We bring in now the man in the Santa hat, also known as Peter Eckbert, who is the national lawyer for the National HBPA. Peter, thanks for joining us. And I'm glad to have you on today because I think it's fair of the writer's room to give your side of the history of dispute equal time. We've had Lisa Lazarus on a few times, and we want to hear more from what you guys have to say about his and the ongoing dispute. And my first question, I mean this all, uh, very sincerely, I've never been quite sure why the national HBPA is so anti-HISA. Obviously, they think it's not good for horsemen and by extension, not good for horse racing. But again, I've never really personally been able to connect the dots. I don't know if you guys have gotten the message out uh, properly enough, at least that's the way I feel. So what is it about HISA that at the end of the day, the national HBPA really doesn't like? Well, there, there are a number of things that, that are troubling. Uh, one, of course, anytime a bill is unconstitutional, then it's uh, illegal and, and uh, should, should not be enforced and, and it violates the Constitution. But that's that's one part of it. And the part that the, we that was part of the, the lawsuit, the major part of our lawsuit had to do with the anti with with the private delegation uh, aspects of the uh, of the law. Uh, but there are other things that are equally troubling. One of the things that that uh, seems I have real uh, reservations about is a lack of transparency because we don't we have no clue as to uh, how things are decided, what me, what happens in the meetings. Generally, there's there's minutes. I mean, I'm sure they keep minutes, and they're, they're, those kind of minutes are usually uh, in a in a public forum, uh, like a, a HISA making rules for for all of us. They would they would have to disclose their minutes and show how people voted and on the board and all that. And there's some kind of uh, accountability. Unfortunately, here as well with HISA, the bylaws you know were written before the law was ever passed. The bylaws were drafted in September 2020. The law didn't pass until December. Uh, the the bylaws clearly uh, make it very difficult for any director once they're on the board to be removed from the board. There has to be cause and cause is defined very narrowly, and then the vote has to be a uh, uh, unanimous vote of all, but the guy that's going to be removed. So it's, it's very difficult to get anyone off the board. So the, there's lack of uh, uh, lack of accountability, as we feel. And then uh, because of the lack of transparency, we don't know. I don't know if you guys know, but you know, I, I asked uh, John Roach, who I respect John Roach a lot. He's a very smart and, and good lawyer. Uh, John sent me a copy of the, of the tax return that was just recently filed. And uh, in that, it shows that HISA has uh, uh, liabilities as of the end of uh, 2021 of $2.9 million to uh, unrelated third parties. Well, that would be nice to know who, who uh, HISA owes money to, uh, just from the standpoint of a conflict of interest. We don't know, we have little information. The budget is is not very specific at, at all. And that would be uh, a welcome change to know where, where uh, who's getting paid what and how, how the money's being spent and, and that sort of thing. And we don't, we have general categories, but those are very broad and almost too broad for, for us to really uh, gleam anything from. Uh, the other thing that's troubling with HISA is the funding. I mean, we've got uh, budgets that are coming through now at $73 million, and those are being assessed against the, the horsemen. And that's, you know, and there's no real representation on the horseman's part to know, you know, again, how that's being spent or, or, or who voted for this or, or who's being contracted. Uh, I know I asked back uh, when we had a, 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 a forum with the, at the Churchill, uh, when Lisa Lazarus was there, and I asked her for a 
copy of the contract that was between HITSA and the uh, drug-free uh, sports um, and it, where, you know, uh, they're being paid to, to take over the drug program that's effective January 1. And um, she told me that was private, that I wasn't entitled to it. And I've asked for, I've asked for the agreements uh, with the, uh, with the states to see, uh, you know, if there's, if, are they uniform? Are those agreements, uh, do they, they uh, continue with uniformity or are those agreements specialized for the state and different for each state? I don't know that because we haven't been provided those things. But again, transparency is, is vitally important for trust. And without transparency, there can't be the, the trust that, that's necessary for this type of an entity. I guess uh, the other thing that we have a problem with is the lack of due process, because the way it's set up is, you know, we all know how it, it works. If you have a violation currently, you go in that state, you 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 uh, go before the stewards and you, you have a hearing. And then if, if you don't agree with the results of that hearing, you can take it on to an administrative law judge. And if you, after that's ruled upon, and then the commission signs off on that or changes that or whatever, then it goes to the to a, a, the legal system into a, a court where you have a neutral judge who makes the decision. Um, with HISA, it's there's really no there's there's no trial by jury that's all administrative. And so we have we have some real significant issues and, and the expense involved in trying to to fight a any kind of a violation uh, is is it's astronomical. So, in essence, when you make something so expensive uh, that it's it's difficult for the uh, the trainer, the the normal trainer, to, to fight, then that makes due process sort of fly out the window. And um, so, those are some of the things that, that we have troubles with with HISA. Not just the the anti well, not just the the delegation issue, which is what the Fifth Circuit found there was no accountability and in in delegating to a private entity was against the Constitution. Uh, there's also a Sixth Circuit case that's coming up uh, to be argued December the 7th, at, and since before that, uh, that circuit, and uh, that, one of the arguments in there, one of the primary arguments in there is the anti-commandeering, where the federal government can't uh, require the state to, to spend money and, and that sort of thing. So it's, um, uh, there are a number of things we have that, uh, in it, that we have trouble with with HISA. And, and maybe our message didn't get out as loud and clear as it should have. Um, again, uh, we work at National. There's a there's a staff of two. Uh, Eric is the CEO, Eric Camelback, and he's he spends about 60 hours a week, if not more, uh, on HPPA stuff. And then we have uh, Lauren Manette, who's like the our head administrator in the office and then myself and Lauren's part-time and, and I'm, I'm part-time. So there's not, uh, you know, we don't have a big staff to, to go, do a good, uh, or perhaps we should have more emphasis on our uh, public relations. We have a public relations committee and we try to get people informed and get news out on a daily basis to our affiliates so they can distribute it out to the um, their members, uh, but uh, again, I'm not saying it's flawless or it's not. It would be nice to be able to to have a, a full staff of PR people to be able to do that, but we don't. Well, Peter, that's a pretty that's a pretty aggressive laundry list of uh, potential objections to HISA there. But the the one angle, legal angle, that as you pointed out, really resonated with the courts is the delegation of lawmaking authority from the FTC to HISA. Now, it, it stands to reason, at least I would believe, that the HBPA would not be in favor of the Federal Trade Commission making laws for horse racing. So That's was true. that just was that was that just a convenient vehicle uh, to try to get HISA struck down? Or is there anything that can be changed in HISA that would make the HBPA support HISA as an entity? Well, I think I gave you a laundry list of some of the issues we like to see changed with HISA, uh, not just the FTC involvement. We, we always have said that we thought that if any any uh, federal agency were to have supervisory authority, it should be the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, and not and not the FTC. Uh, but at the same time, we 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 feel that there there are a number of issues with high, with HISA or HISA that 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 dictate that it, it not come into play that it that makes significant changes and there are other ways to doing it as Ed Martin often says you know you don't burn the house down to fix the kitchen and we can get that kitchen fixed without burning the house down it seems like the structure 
that that there uh, that Hissa brings into play is is radical and and leaves a lot of things on the table that shouldn't be left. With with the current structure, the way things are now, I, I understand that there is an issue of uniformity, and we are for uni uniformity. We work with the ARCI. They have they they have the model rules committee, and we participated in those model rules committees uh, for a long, long time. And, and we give input. They sometimes accept our input. They sometimes don't. But at least we know what's going on and who and what the reason is that our input is is rejected or it's often adopted. But we get we get a chance to comment on those model rules, and and at least we feel like they're sort of a product of of our input and our uh, participation in the process. Whereas with HISA, these things are just coming out and they're telling us this is the way it is. And a lot of times we're wondering who came up with that shoe rule? Who came up with the crop rule? How did they do that? What what was the rationale for that? Some of these things, you know, just makes you what you wonder. So so do you believe that there's that there are so many issues with HISA that it's un that it's unfixable? Well it, it can be anything can be fixed, but it's gonna take a it's gonna take a a, a a monumental effort to do that. It's not just a, a one fix. Well, let's give the FTC a little more supervisory control. It's got to be more than that. You've got to bring transparency and open the open the windows and the doors and let's see what's going on. Let's see how the uh, you know how the sausage made. And uh, that's I think that's where I came from. So, Pete, is there a good alternative to Heiser? I mean, what is the alternative if Heiser does not get pushed through? I mean, there was a bill to push it to 2024. Is, is that on the table? Or do you guys well, have that would be, a yeah, new we're, idea? We're, well, yeah, we support that bill, HR 9132, which uh, Representative uh, Gooden uh, introduced from Texas. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the timing is not the greatest with the new Congress coming in and all that. But yeah, that would be, that would be a nice step in the right direction to, to put off trying to enforce uh, what what we know from the highest court so far to say is an unconstitutional law. Um, and, and nobody knows what the Sixth Circuit is going to do, but I wouldn't be surprised that they would go along with the Fifth Circuit. But in any event, what what, what we feel like could could add uniformity and, and be a quick fix would be a medication uh, uh, compact uh, where the states opt in to be covered. If you want to basically have a, uh, uh, if you want to have simulcasting and, and be in compliance, they could add additional con uh, condition that you have to uh, adopt the the uh, compact and the compact then would make it uh, easy and people would have input uh, into that. To, so the medication rules would have some some input and some uh, contribution from, from all the, the horsemen. How is that different from the national uniform medication that is now defunct, the one that failed? How is the new med me medication compact difference? Well, the, the NOP was adopted, you know, in the mid-Atlantic by, I think, 11 or 12, maybe 13 uh, jurisdictions. Uh, and and uh, the, the difference would be with a compact that it, once a state adopts it, then, then it automatically becomes that state law. Uh, so it would not, it wouldn't, they could change it and it would they, they wouldn't have to go back through the veg various legislatures to get it changed whereas now with, with it with a change uh if you try to do some uniform like enough you almost have to go to each state legislator to get the legislate uh, legislative body to get them to uh, to adopt it and that that is uh pretty much unworkable it takes it takes so long to get that accomplished some states happens right away other states it takes forever so it, if you have a compact that they've signed on then that would allow the compact administration to to make those those changes in a relatively quick manner peter as you know from i'm sure you've been following things that i've said and i've written i think the sport has an integrity problem you know maybe you don't maybe the people at the national hbpa don't feel that way but i do and you know we've seen some very serious things happen with jason service and jorge navarro i think there's got to be a better way than the status quo um, do you want to comment on that? And is the compact that you just talked about, is that good enough? Is that really going to help this sport clean up its well, act? I, I agree with you. That's the first step. Okay. That's that there's got to be more than that. I agree that there should be some type of a, uh, a multi-jurisdictional investigative agency. And, and that can be funded as well by, you know, by the, by the federal government. Uh, and that, that could have uh, the powers that sort of like that HISA has or that a, that a state racing commission has to go in and, and do investigations. That's, 
th that's the, the way that Navarro and service are, are caught was through through the you know through that private investigation and not through the the testing but a lot of people are are either caught or they or the testing allows for uh, uh, a, a you know a deterrent uh, that people will not then try to try to push the envelope uh, too far or you know they know that there's there's consequences especially if they're they're testing but uh, if there's testing going on and there was under the current regime there's a, been a lot of testing that you know the RC has been been involved in and, and, and keeps records of and you know uh, again the, the majority of horsemen I'd say 99% are, are, are honest hardworking and try to do things the right way in a fair way now you're always going to find a bunch of uh, people who are going to take shortcuts and try to try to uh, you know uh, get play the system and and that's the those are the kind of people we don't want to see in the in the industry because that just hurts the industry and gives us a bad name and and the only thing that one of the things i have a problem with i shouldn't say the only thing, one of the things i have a problem with from my standpoint is that it seems that the the negative and i guess that's that's just that's the media and that's where we do things now is that if there's a negative it gets blown out way up and the the good hardworking folks you don't hear a whole lot about them uh, and that's you know i mean i guess i'm i'm thinking utopia and, and all good and mother and apple pie and all that but uh at the same time i wish there was more uh, good stories about our good hard, hard working horsemen that, that do it the right way so in a nutshell, Peter, the reason why you're here with us today is that you do not believe that the National HPPA deserves to be on Santa's naughty list. <laughs> exactly. I think we should be on the nice list. We all have the same goals. We want to see we want to see fair horse racing. We want to see, you know, our, our equine athletes taken care of and given the best treatment they possibly can get. And, and we want the rules to be fair for everybody, not just, to, you know, we want to be fair across the board. And good racing and, and racing that people know and can feel that uh, it's been done the right way. Peter, so you're wearing better... you're wearing your magic Santa hat. If it could just yes. be you in charge of everything, and you have all your little elves. Oh, running oh around. my, we, we, uh, Zoe, we'd have a problem if I was in charge of everything. You don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> but but what would be what would be your advice? Like if you could rule the world and have your elves running around and were in charge of horse racing, how would you do it? What what's the magic answer? Well, I I guess the 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 answer is that we try to you know we we try to police ourselves and and when you know that now you go in the the airports and you're constantly saying you know if you see something say something you know and I guess that's what the horsemen we we nobody wants to be a squealer nobody wants to be you know do, doing things like that that uh, you know have been frowned upon for years but maybe that's where we need to be that if you feel like somebody's really doing something there ought to be a uh, a someone that security that you can report to without repercussions and that somebody's investigated and, and checked out if if i mean not just because you got beat in a race i mean that's 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 not the way it should be but if you feel like you see some things going on that shouldn't be going on report those and let's let's clean up whatever needs to be cleaned up but again we feel that that on uh, for the whole like 99 percent of the, the folks are are good honest and and, and comply with the rules uh, Peter, you won a major battle in the Fifth Circuit with the court declaring that it's unconstitutional. You go to the Sixth Circuit now, and uh, based on the judges that were appointed to the panel, the conventional wisdom is you're going to win that as well. If you win in the Sixth Circuit, what happens next? And if Heiser can't, uh, if if you win there, and if Heiser can't get the Supreme Court to take the case, is Heiser dead? Well, the, the, there's the, the third. Well, I get there's there's. A couple of options. Let me run through the options real quick. Okay, the options for the Fifth Circuit case, they can they can ask for an en blanc hearing, which, which is all 16 judges to hear it. I don't think that would be successful because the, in our case, all three judges ruled in, uh, that it was unconstitutional. So we had a, a, a two two Republicans and one Democrat on that panel. Uh, so I, again, I don't think that. But they could ask for it, and maybe they would get it, and maybe there would be a a difference of opinion, but I don't think so. I think the Fifth Circuit would, would rule that way. Now, the Sixth Circuit, you're correct that the two judges, uh, Judge Sutton and Judge uh, uh, Griffin, uh, are also uh, states' rights type judges, conservative judges that likely would uh, rule that uh, that Heist is unconstitutional. 
uh, if they ruled it was constitutional, then then you'd have a, a, a difference in, in circuits and to get to the Supreme Court be much easier. The Supreme Court doesn't take that many cases. They take maybe one in a hundred. So to get there to begin with is, is difficult. But if you have a difference in circuits, it's much easier. Uh, again, if the Sixth Circuit rules that it's unconstitutional, then it's unlikely that they would be able to get there. Now, the other, so if you can't get to the, to the Supreme Court, then the, the only other alternative they have is to go back to the legislature. And, you know, with the change of things going on now with the, the differences uh, in, in control of the House, uh, and, and, you know, I don't know how that would work, but, it, you know, that would be one avenue they could take. Now, otherwise, if it's unconstitutional, then it's, you know, then it's, it's done. Then what? Say again, then what? Then what? Then what happens? Then, well, what we're working on, uh, what we're trying to do is some alternative legislation and working on uh, trying to get the medication compact uh, in, in final form that everybody can, can accept and go for. So we're, we're, we're working to try to, 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 to make some changes that need to be made and that uh, we, would, we would work with anybody that wants to work with us and, and sit down at the table and, and try and get something ironed out. I think the horsemen, one of the good benefits of HISA is that they've seen what can happen if they don't become involved because they were all sitting on their hands thinking, oh, this will never happen. Well, it happened. And so they need, you know, I think now they'll, they'll hopefully uh, see that they need to be active and, and try and make things that, that the, you know, try and make a contribution that, that we all live, can live with. You guys want me to check with Santa on, on what list you're on? That would be great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, Peter Eckerberg, thanks so much for your time and thanks for the insights and an interesting story. We'll all stay tuned to see what happens, uh, whether Heise is going to go forward or not. Again, thanks so much for your time, Peter. Thank you all. You all have a good Christmas. You too. Nominations for the 2023 PA Sired PA Bread Stallion Series are underway right now. If you have a yearling, don't forget to nominate. It's $200, the nomination fee, until December 31st. Then it goes up to $500. Then it goes up to $1,000. And the late noms next year are actually $5,000. So get your nomination in now for just $200. Next year, the series will expand to include three days of two two-year-old races each, one for Colton, one for Phillies, starting at five and a half furlongs, then six and a half, and then one mile. And a $50,000 trainer bonus will be awarded to each of the top three point-earning horses. Another note, Wanamakers will host the second annual PA Bread Sale in conjunction with the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association, the PHBA. That'll be December 4th through the 8th. You can learn more at wanamakers.com. Now for this message from the PHBA. Here in Pennsylvania, we're proud of our breeding program, the best in North America, but we're also proud to be leaders in this industry. The PA Horse Breeders Association is funding cutting edge research at Penn Vet to detect gene doping in thoroughbreds. And we endorsed the SAFE Act to help protect the most vulnerable horses. Plus, we're pleased to support the aftercare programs set up by our horsemen's groups. Just a few of the reasons why you should join us in Pennsylvania, the premier place to breed and race. In case you don't know by now, our Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by none other than the Green Group, which is an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm that specializes in the thoroughbred industry. They have proven strategies to save you taxes, a lot of clients in the business, and you can learn more about the Green Group at www.greencode.com. Bill? And we welcome in now the Green Group Guest of the Week, which makes absolutely no sense because Leonard Green, who is the Green Group, is the Green Group Guest of the Week. So Len, guess what? Congratulations. You just won a free hour of tax consultation with yourself. How about that? <laughs> so but we're glad to have- Go ahead, Bill. Always glad to have Len on because he has such good- Not only are we going to talk about Wonder Wheel, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Philly Champion, but it's getting late in the year, Len. There's almost uh, just one month and a day to go. In this late uh, stage in the game, what can people do- to save on taxes for 2023 come April 15th. Actually, Bill, that, that, that is the most important month of the year. I mean, because in, in essence, most of our clients, okay, are on the cash basis. So therefore, if they make payments before the end of December 31st, they can get a tax deduction for this year. Also, because of the fact that bonus depreciation is the number one largest deduction that people the horse business take. And, and basically what that means is if you buy a horse or if you buy 
horse equipment, okay, or a farm, or as long as you take title to it, okay, you can take the tax deduction 100% in this year. If you wait till next year, you only can get 80% of it as a, as a immediate tax deduction. So it's a re, real advantage. And if you have yearlings, okay, the other little twist is you can't really take bonus depreciation on them unless you put them in service. What does that mean? That means you call up your trainer and say, hey, take the horse out of the barn and start it training toward its two-year-old year. And then the horse is considered in service, and therefore you can take the deduction on that yearling in this year. Also, there's an awful lot of expenses you can prepay. Again, my trainer said, why don't you pay your, your January bill in December? And I said, fine, just give me a discount. Okay, but again, seriously, if you take deduction, if you have a deduction that you're going to have to pay in January, why not pay it in December? Just write your check out and have it dated December 31st and you're in business there. And then the charitable contributions, especially today, okay, being being charitable day, okay, we, we've gone ahead and contributed part of our earnings from Wonder Wheel, okay, to nobody to new vocations and other charities like that. I think it's just a wonderful, wonderful idea. And then we're also setting up a a Christmas party for the whole group that's in our barns. Okay, again, they've earned it. So why not do it and pay it in this year? So again, those are all good ideas. And then just one more of them. There was a recent tax court case, okay, which the IRS said, big victory for the IRS, because we proved this Skolnick versus commissioner, we've made eight years of hobby losses, which are not deductible. Great victory for the IRS. Baloney. Okay, it's a great victory, actually, for horsemen, because they laid out exactly what Skolnick did wrong. And if you then conversely do what Skolnick did not do, you have a, a beautiful plan in which you can handle yeah. And, and the biggest one of, of that whole thing, and again, I won't go into it in great detail because we are coming up with an article in TDN on it. But basically, he co-mingled everything. He used his personal account for paying some business expenses and some personal expenses. He bought personal horses with it. He had no business plan. He didn't listen to TDN, so he didn't have the 100 hours of, that you need to be active. He did everything you could do wrong. Great victory for the IRS. It's a great victory for us because now if we say we will do these kinds of things, I think you've got a great case that you're actively involved in a business. Actively involved means you can take tax deductions against ordinary income. Da, 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 da. How's that? Sounds good. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Well, Lynn, I know you guys love people like me who start thinking about taxes when the calendar gets to April the 1st. Yeah. Uh, but then again, I, I don't have a, a farm or a, or a stable or a bunch of yearlings to worry about. Good advice so far. What, well, Randy? Let me just interrupt you just for a second, okay? Because sure, we actually sure. do. We, we we actually do thirty or forty trainers. The, the the thing that they miss most, okay, and their accountants miss is now home office deductions are allowed, and you guys they're allowed because you guys are working eight days a week and nights and all kinds of things, and most of the trainers. Their, their, their accountants are back in the, the, the old age, okay, three or four years ago, where you couldn't have a home office if, if, you, if you had other space. But now you definitely can have a home office. And you start figuring out, okay, I have one room out of eight, okay, that I use for my home office and I have a computer in there and I watch things. Well, you can deduct the computer. You can deduct one-eighth of your heat, light, power, insurance, repairs, maintenance, and depreciation on your house. That's a big ticket item that most people are forgetting. Can I deduct dog food? Is that is that is that possible? Or <laughs> that, uh, probably well, again, not. If, if it's blue, if it's if it's Blue Buffalo, which which is a company that I used to own, okay, and, and we <laughs> sold it for eight billion dollars. Okay, we figure out a way to do that. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, are there any other changes uh, in the tax laws pertaining to thoroughbred uh, the, the thoroughbred industry that people should be aware of? Yeah, Randy, that's a great question. The, the, the biggest one, okay, has to do with that immediate tax deduction. It's called bonus depreciation. And why it's so big is the previous thing that we had was a, a called the Section 179, 
which was a great deduction and allowed us to do 100%. But if you lost money, you couldn't use it. Okay? Bonus depreciation, you can use it even if you've lost money on your operation. But that goes from 100% immediate deduction to 80% next year. So I'm saying it really makes sense to make those payments. And it's not just on horses, it's on equipment and other, other things that they're, they're involved. So then that, that, that's probably the biggest one. You can also, there's if you want to set up an IRA or, or a Keogh pension plan for yourself, you set it up now before December 31st, and you have until next October to actually make the payment. And it counts as if it was made December 31st. So again, the, 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 those are very, very big eh, 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 as far as the horse business is, is concerned. And then again, going back to you don't have a farm, but other people either have a farm. And the key is, well, what's deductible on the farm? Well, only only the buildings, Lynn, and, and, and not the, the residents or, and the barns. Who the heck cares about that if you have to depreciate over 30 years? Well, the answer is you don't have to anymore. Now, with, with the new tax law, you're allowed to look at that barn and say, is that a special purpose building? If it is, you can write it off in one year. Well, how, how you, have a, you have a shed that, that, that stores the, the feed in. Special purpose. Write it off in one year. Look around you. Have you been taking any of the fences? Have you been taking some certain kinds of the trees? Have you taken the, the, the roadways? Most people don't, and they could. Wow, that, that's a lot of deductions. Now, how about winning the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies? How did that affect your taxes, Len? Is that, is that a big deduction? How, how do we go forward from here? And by the way, well done with Wonder Wheel. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, it was a, a real thrill. It, I guess it's the reason why you're, I'm in the business for 40 some odd years uh, to win something like that. And people say, well, you, you actually won it before. Well, yeah, but that wasn't as much as, as this one because this one was kind of planned out. Ha ha, planned out. You know, man plans and God laughs sometimes. But this was a new setup, okay? We have, we, 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 got, we have a new manager, okay? And he said, hey, let's change the operation. And I said, John, I've been running this thing for so many years. And I certainly know what I'm doing. Well, let's change it. So we, we changed it in the sense that now, and, and Randy, I think you can appreciate this, okay, what, 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 what Mark is doing. He pointed out that Len used to buy yearlings, okay, and you used to put them on a farm and, and they would break them. But the farm that they're breaking them on, okay, also breaks horses for sales. And the breaking of horses for sales should be different than breaking the horses for racing because you're pushing yeah. the horses a lot faster, right, Randy, to, to do that. Exactly. That, that 10 seconds or, or 21 seconds or something if you're going to sell it. So this time, for the first time, we had not only had, had Mark pick, pick out the, the horses. But, 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 oh, he, he had it easy because Kim and other people, you know, take these 2,000, 3,000 horses and they, they, they break them down. So, but it's still, he had, he had to look at several hundred horses, okay? And, and then being a trainer, okay, I'm sure Randy the same thing. That's nice that they gave us this list, but, but you know what? I'm going to walk around to the barns and, and pull out horses that I want to look at myself. And so anyway, he, we now are short list. But this year, for the first year, back one year, okay, we actually took those horses and let Mark bring them along for racing. And, and, and then he said, OK, I think this horse has ability. So let's go forward to, to November and work backwards from November. Okay, so each race was actually spaced out. Now, again, it all has to fall into place, obviously, okay? but it fell into place that every month, okay, we had picked out a race. Okay? And, then, and then typical of trainers, okay, we finished second in the spinaway, and he says, that's okay. That's not the race I was aiming for. <laughs> I was aiming for the Breeders' Cup, right? So, again, it was very exciting, but it was kind of fell into place. Now, again, they kid us owners. They, 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 they let us play the, the, the trainer sometimes. You give the orders to, to Tyler. Okay, Tyler, you, you know how you've won before, and we charted this race out, John and I, 
Okay, so here's the speed to the inside. We can take care of that. Here's the speed to the outside. Okay, make those horses go around us. Power says, sure. Okay, we break last. <laughs> <laughs> so, Len, you plotted out a course. You plotted out a course to the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. What's the course that Mark, uh, John, and you are, are plotting out for the Kentucky Oaks? I assume she's going to fairgrounds. Um, and kind of, you have any thoughts yet on what her campaign will look like for 2023? Do you want what they did thinking about it or what I'm thinking about? You, you're the <laughs> boss. <laughs> you pay the bills. You, you know, Randy, it, it's funny. Okay, many, many years ago when I started, okay, I started with somebody called Walter Reese, who won a lot of races for us over the years. And the first horse we got with Walter, I said to him, I want to give the stud the jockey, the orders. And he said, fine. Okay. So I, I gave him this, what you do here? And here's the time I think you should have here and keep the horse to the outside. And he said, si, senor, because he didn't understand English. <laughs> Is that typical of, of trainers? All right. Going back to your your question, okay? And, and Bill, you're, you must have looked at at our playbook because the fairgrounds is probably the first one in the list. And then if it wins there, where it goes from there and there. Okay. But the ultimate is okay. Somewhere. Okay. In May. Okay. There's a couple of races. Okay. And I think we're going to cross enter. Okay. Okay. Into both the Oaks and some other race that's won run in May. Okay. But the ultimate challenge is still going to be the Oaks and then the Ashland and work your way back. However, I'm going to tell you, we have a lot of other good horses in our stable. <laughs> so who knows what's going to happen? How about Renegade Red Bull? I mean, she was just so impressive winning the Nazarene, the daughter of Nyquist. You paid a lot of money for her, but she sure turned it around since going to Woodbine. Zoe, thank you. Okay. And again, I take credit for all these purchases because I'm the one that cuts the check. Now, you know, again, I think to be successful as a business, let's put the, the, the business hat on for a second. Okay? I think you got to run these things as a business. Now, again, it's, it's not going to work as easy. But then again, most businesses don't work as, as easy. So there's always something that comes up that's unexpected. So you have to account for that but you should have a business strategy and plan and, and, and not only for for the sake of of it but also just in case the irs ever looks and says hey what was your plan you, you may have lost money but did you have some opportunities to do it did you buy fillies and then colts and then uh, did, did you go overseas to buy horses and brood mares and are you buying better brood mares now so that you can breed and, and get all kinds of stallion and, and, and broodmare contracts and things that you don't have to pay. So again, it's all part so that you then can get into book one or book two. So again, there, it, there's definitely a plan. Okay, so okay, Renegade is is, is down there. And again, one of the advantages that not only of all the hard work that goes into these short lists, but when you figure that the accounting firm has 800 clients, okay, and, and over a hundred of them. Okay, our consigners at sales. Okay, now, again, they're in it to make business, to make profits. They don't necessarily, okay, tell you, okay, what might be the, their best horse. But when you threaten them, when I'm going to turn you into the IRS if you, if you ever <laughs> give me a bad horse, okay, well, then you have a little competitive advantage, okay? okay. Barry Eisman is, is one of the best in the business, Doc, okay? And we went to his, his consignment. And he said, Lynn, there is an outstanding horse here, but I'm not sure you can afford it. I got to tell you, Len, I loved her at the sale. She was at the top of my list. So well done you for getting her and paying 700000 for her because she was awesome. How much did we pay? Really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it's okay. The, 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 the other horse, the, the, the 275000 Zoe, that really was, was an RNA. OK. Yeah. And, and again, it's the way, way back in our in our early days. OK. Bob Scanlon you, you, you used to pick out horses for us. Bless his soul. OK. And he used to say, don't worry about the fact that you, you didn't buy the horse. I said, what do you mean? 
It may have been RNA. And his he went back that night and, and saw what the RNAs were and then went to the consigners. So the next morning when we got up at six o'clock, he said, come on over. He said, we, we have an opportunity to buy this horse or that horse. And I, I, I never realized that that was an, was an alternative to it. So there's a story behind, behind each one of these. Plus there's a story behind, somebody said to me the other day, you're, 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 you're now made, now have won 2,478 races. I said, you're probably close. I said, but we've also lost 8,622 <laughs> races, and I keep track of that side of the <laughs> So again, uh, uh, you guys have a great show, incidentally, also. And you, 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 you don't emphasize enough that to be active in this business, you should have at least 100 hours. What does that mean? Well, listening to your telecasts and, and podcasts and things, that counts as part of it. Because they, they, there's so much you can learn from these things. Because it, we, we're not just talking red and blue and, and make believe. We're talking real and things that they can do and can't do. And that's so important to this game. You would never. There's so many people who are successful in, in other businesses who come into this business and think they can leave their head behind. They they gotta know more about it. They gotta more, be more involved in it. And that. That lends itself to success. Of course, I don't, I don't want to be as con- con- controversial though as you are on certain of your subject matters. But you know, but again, uh, again, just just being a, a horse owner for a moment, I really thought, okay, that one of the answers to this business was was, was the HISA kind of thing, and. and it, if if it gets turned down, then you got to find something else because it was the right answer. Okay, maybe it's be done a different way, but I really enjoyed going to the Breeders' Cup and standing there in the in the shed row and watching these eight or ten veterinarians every day looking at the horses. To me, that was a real positive. I felt much better about that. Hmm? Well, once again, the Green Group guest of the week, Len Green. I know that makes no sense, but nonetheless, that's the way we did it. Len, thanks so much for your insights. Best of luck with Wonder Wheel on the road to the Kentucky Oaks next year. Congratulations on your victory in the Breeders' Cup and the Eclipse Award that's coming your way fairly shortly. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So once again, you can learn more about the Green Group and everything they can do for you in the tax consulting and advisory business by logging on to www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from the Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The TDN Rice's Room is brought to you by XBTV. The XBTV.com work of the week is Carbo Spirit. Seen working here solo and my goodness, does he look terrific. Working here on the training track at Santa Anita in a minute flat. Now Carbo Spirit, I think guys, he is in the form of his life. I have never seen as good him look as good as he looks coming in right now and he will of course run in this weekend's grade one hollywood derby for george papa padromo the xbtv workout of the week brought to you by xbtv bill Cabo spirit looks terrific he's gonna be one of the top choices for this weekend's grade one hollywood derby well it's a big weekend of racing we've got the two grade ones at del mar the matriarch and the hollywood derby at aqueduct we have the remsen the demoiselle and the grade one cigar but zoe since we're on the subject why don't you give us a little preview 
of the two grade one races to be run this weekend at Del Mar. A closing right, week well, at Del Mar, by the way. Yeah, I already mentioned the grade one Hollywood Derby. Looks like the, the winner of the Twilight Derby, Cabo Spirit, will be going forward there for George Papa Padromo. I love him going in there. He's already proven at Del Mar. Speaking Scout, who was the runner-up to him in the Twilight Derby, will be going forward there. Spy Catcher will be going forward in the Del Mar Derby and perhaps War at Sea. Of course, we're recording this on Wednesday. The entries aren't out yet. So the Grade 1 Hollywood Derby looks like it's going to be a very good race. But guys, how about the Grade 1 Matriarch? Coming in, we've got Chad Brown, who's won four of the last five races. Dolce Zell is coming in now. She was perhaps a controversial scratch the morning of the Valley View. She was a vet scratch at Keeneland. She's coming in as the lone three-year-old in here. Three-year-olds do not have a very good record in the grade one matriarch. But then he's got Regal Glory looking for back-to-back -back wins. Is it just Regal Glory and Chad Brown in the grade one matriarch? I don't think so. We've got Avenue de France. Coming in here, she didn't run very well in the Goldicova last time out. She was slated to be in the Keeneland November sale. This will be her swan song. She'll go in the January sale, the Horses of Racing Age sale. And I think she's got a very good shot. Pizza Bianca goes in there. Like it's just a terrific weekend of racing at Del Mar. And Wakanaka in the Matriarch as well. She looks like she's coming out there. I think that may be one of the best renditions that we're going to see in a long time of the grade one matriarch. Well, I wouldn't call this cigar one of the best renditions we've seen of the cigar. Uh, here are some of the big names in their mind control come off a second last place, last time out. Actually, he crossed the wire second, was placed first through disqualification in the Parks Dirt Mile. Zandon, I assume, will be the favorite for Chad Brown. He runs well every single time out, but doesn't hasn't won since the Bluegrass. Second in the Pennsylvania Derby, third in the Traverse, second in the Jim Dandy. Third in the Kentucky Derby, um, you have uh, Peter Miller bringing in a horse by the name of Get Her Number. Then Norm Cash, Norman Lynn Cash, who we've talked about so much with Beverly Park, is bringing in a horse named Double Crown, who won the Kelso last time out at 42 to 1. He's slated to run seven times between this Saturday's uh, cigar and the end of the year for the trainer who I love who actually believes in running his horses. But, uh, and White Barrio, of course, is in there as well, the Florida Derby winner. He has not been in good form lately. Fifth in the Pennsylvania Derby, seventh in the Haskell. Randy, what do you think of the cigar? It's an evenly matched race. The, the punchline about Lynn Cash and Double Crown is that when they won the Kelso, of course, the horse was coming back on seven days rest. Right. So he's done that over and over and over again. I think the favoritism is going to come down to Zandon and mind control. I think the question about Zandon is the one-turn mile. He doesn't have much early speed. There doesn't look to be a ton of early speed in there. You know, can Zandon stay in touch early or will he drop a little too far back? And mind control is one of my favorite horses. I mean, this horse is just so gutsy. Whenever he gets a horse up next to him, he just almost refuses to get past. And if he does, he comes back and gets the horse again. We've seen it twice out of mind control in his last four races. Uh, back in the Salvador Mile at Monmouth, Hot Rod Charlie, who's a pretty game horse himself, put a head in front of Mind Control at the eighth pole. Mind Control battled back to win. And we saw it earlier in late 2021 in a race at Parks. Silver State got a half length in front of Mind Control in mid stretch. And Mind Control again battled back along the inside to win. So he's a pretty tough out. This horse, Mind Control. It's a pretty evenly matched race, but I think it's going to come down to those two. It should be fun to watch. Randy, who do you like in the Matriarch? You know, Zoe, I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll lean toward Chad Brown and Regal Glory. You know, I, I, that's easy. You know, it's like, a, it's like a softball answer. I know that. <laughs> but, you know, Chad's had success uh, shipping horses out there and, and doing well in those kinds of races at Del Mar. You know, Gray Emotion has two, and he's got a little stable out there. Uh, so, you know, it, it's got, but I agree with you. It, it's going to be a really, really fascinating race to watch. There were jockeys in the news over the weekend. Luis Saez pulled out a win of the uh, riding title at Churchill Downs for that meet. And uh, not that Saez isn't a good rider, he's a great rider, but usually uh, if a guy comes in from out of town, you have a hard time, you know, trying to pick up mounts, trying to pick up business. Uh, not only did he win six on Saturday at Churchill Downs, but he beat Tyler Gaffleone, uh, who was the king of Churchill Downs, for the riding title, 23 to 21. Um, Luis Saez, big feather in his cap, Zoe. Yeah, absolutely. Six races. I think he's just one behind Pat Day and Julian Leperu's record 
of seven there. He also just beat Tyler Gaffleon at Keeland as well. So the pair of them are slated to go head to head at the championship meet that comes up at Goldstream Park as well. So some really exciting things. Don't forget about Angel Cruz in Maryland. He had a six win day this weekend as well. So four letters, last last one ending in Z. I mean, apparently that makes to a six win day. Five of his wins were at Charlestown. Uh, one at Laurel and then rode five at Charlestown. Well done, Angel Cruz. So Bill, what do you know, love, Rand? as a horse player, this will this will resonate with you guys. What I love the most about Luis Saez, back to him, is his aggressiveness. Yeah, I mean, nothing against the Ortiz brothers, who were obviously tremendously talented. I mean, I read Ortiz is on a huge career path in the Breeders' Cup, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they're fantastic riders. But so many top riders nowadays lean toward passiveness and sitting still and waiting and waiting and not really being that aggressive early in a race, even when the situation calls for it. Luis Saez is, is aggressive when when it's advantageous to be aggressive. And as a horse player, I really, really like to see that because it really, it, it helps when you're handicapping races to know that you've got a guy like that on a horse that needs a ride like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely with you. And on top of his aggressiveness, it's a safe kind of aggressiveness. It's not often that we see him being pulled up and like, charging over horses' heels or he's in trouble and he's in the headlines for that. You never hear anything about Louis Saez other than he's a great rider and he's a super, super nice guy. And his agent speaks for himself, really, and Kieran McLaughlin. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. You can join West Point Thoroughbreds for a fraction of the price. You don't have to be a king. You don't have to be a queen. Just go to West Point tb.com. You can learn more about West Point Thoroughbreds. West Point got a win over the weekend with Vava breaking her maiden in fine style at Churchill Downs, trained by Cherie DeVoe. The daughter of Gunrunner was a $280,000 Keelan September purchase last year for West Point Thoroughbreds and partners. We'll be right back after these messages from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the Bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Backstretch workers are the backbone of the thoroughbred racing industry. Without them, racing would not be possible. The New York Racetrack Chaplaincy provides vital programs and services to all the workers and their families, like sponsor a family, the food pantry, as well as other recreational activities and events. You can help by visiting our website and donating today. Every dollar makes a difference to those who give everything to the sport that we love. Well, this week's Remy Bullock cartoon is in, and it's that time of year, it's cold and the horses are starting to get their big winter coats. And all these famous horses out in a field, they're all shaggy and they're looking around and they don't recognize anybody. They can't even tell who they are. So check out Remy's cartoon. It always runs in Friday's TDN. Well, that's a wrap on this week's TDN Writer's Room. Want to thank Zoe Cabman. Want to thank Randy Moss. Want to thank our guest, Peter Eckebert, our Green Group guest of the week, Len Green of the Green Group. Our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Aliyah LaRocca and Anthony LaRocca. We'll see you next week.